thank you for the embarrassing introduction and for the invitation to speak here. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about belief propagation, which is an algorithm or a class of algorithms widely used in machine learning. And I will want to tell you a little bit about the mathematical foundations of it and then about applications in various areas, mainly in uh, systems biology. So I will first tell you what belief propagation is. And to do so, I will introduce the notion of a graphical model. Um, I will give you a simple example matching where we actually totally understand the mathematics of it. Um, then I go to another example where it works very well, but we don't understand anything. And then I go to applications in networks and in systems biology, where it again works very well, and we understand even less. So um, well, that's the wrong direction. So graphical models. So what are graphical models? Graphical models is a way of representing a probability distribution over all kinds of variables. Um, in principle, you can do any probability distribution, it, but it only becomes useful if your constraints are somewhat local. Let's say I sort of distribute colors on the people in this room, and I want to put some constraints at what these two guys are doing. They have both blue shirts. It's illegal because if I'm sort of not that well in seeing, I wear contacts, and I can't really see whether it's one or two people, so that's bad. Okay, I don't. So you put certain local constraints, and then you have, but otherwise I have some probability distribution, let's say, of colors. And then we can model this with a graphical model. I will describe that in more detail. So what you have, you have a set of random variables in this example, the colors of the shirts that people are wearing in this room. And um, then I assign those to the node of a graph. The graph here would be the being neighbors in this room. In general, a hypergraph. I'll tell you what it is in a moment. And then you give an a prior distribution of colors. Jennifer would get very heavily weighted to black. And I would normally get very heavily weighted to red. But we have a constraint that red and black don't look good together. And we have another constraint that I'm in New York, and you're not supposed to wear red, so I'm wearing gray. Um, so that is some a prior distribution of colors on the different people. And now you put these constraints I was talking about. So what they are doing there is very unlikely to have two blue shirts next to each other. And more general, you might form groups of people and say, OK, I want a nice mixture of color. So I put groups of local groups of four or five people. I would like to use all colors in it. And you can put all kinds of constraints. So in general, you have hyper edges. So what are hyper edges? So a hyper edge is, in general, just a set of nodes. Okay, So if I have a graph, an edge is a set of two nodes of neighbors. And if I have a three regular hypergraph, you would have triples. And you would put constraints on the triples. In statistical physics, that happens very often. And it also happens a lot in machine learning that you have constraints on more than two variables. And you put now all of this together to a probability distribution. So what do we have? We have our variables. So indexed by v, which is sort of the set of variables, equals the vertex set of your hypergraph for each variable you put a priori weight, where Jennifer gets a large weight if it's black and a small one if it's red. And I get a large one if it's red or gray. And here you put all your constraints. You multiply them all together. You sum over all possible assignments. You get some normalization constant. And you have a probability distribution. Okay? So that's a graphical model. And I know that questions are supposed to come in the end. But I think I should make sure that this is clear. And if not, maybe I mingles a notation or so. So is that, is that roughly clear what, what a graphical model is? Z. Z is a normalization constant. So, so the, the probability of a given assignment of colors is given by multiplying these numbers. But if you just multiply the numbers and you sum over all possible colors, it may be 20. And the probability distribution shouldn't sum up to 20, so you have to divide by 20. So Z is chosen in such a way that the sum over all assignments is 1. So sigma lives on the node. 
So C is a subset of the so an edge is an is a subset of nodes. So this is a collection of all the sigmas of the nodes in C. Okay. So once we have that, we can visually represent that by what's called a factor graph. So in the factor graph, you put on the left all the variables. On the right, you put all the constraints. And now I put an edge between a variable and a constraint if that variable is constrained by that constraint. Okay? So if there's an edge between Jennifer and me, we put a constraint for the edge on the right. And then we link that edge to me and to Jennifer because there's a constraint in the color between the two of us. I can hear you anyhow. <laughs> Push the button. It's on button. So the Push the button and talk into the mic. Oh, okay. <laughs> so now <laughs> oh, it must be broken. Anyway, five phi sub c is that a probability per se of the constraint being on and off? Where is phi sub you mean psi? Psi, psi, sorry. No, this is if it's a constraint, it's just either zero or one. And it's one if the constraint is satisfied, and zero if it's not. Okay. So if this were an edge, and I require that neighbors have a different color, then this is zero. If if the if the if you look at an edge, so this edge between the two of them, that's C, and they have the same color, so psi becomes zero, and it gets zero probability in the end. And between Jennifer and me, we have a different color, so psi is one. So what we want to calculate is maybe the probability distribution of my color. Okay, so for that you have to take into account that there are certain constraints, and if Jennifer is black, then I can't be black. But we have to know how probable it is that I am not black. I have to know Jennifer's probability and everybody else's probability. So I sum out all the. Um, this is a slightly bad notation. Forget this. I sum out all the colors except for i, then I get what's called the marginal of the variable sigma i. So we might want to know this probability distribution, or we might want what's called the modes. So we might, for example, say, what is the most likely distribution of colors in this room? That is called the mode, so the configurations with maximal weight. So belief propagation is a way to calculate these quantities in a nice way. It's in general not exact. So it's formulated in terms of messages. So what are these messages? I talked just a moment ago about marginals. So marginals are the probability distribution of this one variable if you sum out the rest. But these are modified marginals, namely where you either ignore a constraint or only use a certain constraint. So one of them we call the message from the uh, variable i to the constraint c. And what the variable i will tell constraint c, it will say, so I will tell to the edge between Jennifer and me, I will say, if I forget about this edge, then my probability distribution would be such and such. So in particular, I could be quite well black, even though maybe Jennifer has very high probability of black. So I will send, so I see the rest of the world, but I forget that I have a direct connection to Jennifer. So this margin is calculated by just leaving out the constraint C and connecting to the rest of the world through all the other constraints I have, and then the other people have their own distribution. All of that I take into account, but I throw out this one constraint. Why don't you call it conditional probability? Um, it would be that on a tree, but in general, it's sort of, you can call it a conditional probability. Uh, it's, well, it's not, you see, I don't condition on an event. I remove, I change my probability mass, model. I move, remove a term in the interaction. So it's not really. 
she asking me why I don't call it a conditional probability. And, um, and I'm saying it sometimes is and sometimes isn't. Um, but I think she and I disagree on that. So um, in any case, it's, it's also sort of, you know, I'm a physicist. We like our own language that will make people like you think you don't understand, and that makes me look better. Uh, so um, I mean, these are, in many cases, actually conditional probabilities. But I specifically define what it is, right? It's a marginal if we ignore this constraint. Then we have another marginal, which is the other way around. So the constraint, so in this case, this edge, will tell me that if I saw the world only through this one edge and didn't all the other edges I forget, then I would get a certain marginal. So these two marginals um, you can now try to calculate. And it seems natural to say, OK, maybe there is some iterative way how we can calculate one from the other. And I will sort of argue this without being precise because it's actually not rigorous. And then I will tell you on trees it actually is rigorous. Okay? So, if I want to calculate, excuse me, Christian. Yeah. Um, the, the second one, the red marginal. Yes. Are you are you leaving in place the constraints in the rest of the universe and just yes. changing your constraints? Yes. Okay. Okay. So let's look at this. When I look at the first one, okay, the marginal I would have if I ignored the constraint at c. So what marginal do I have? Well, I first look at my prior. I have to put that in. And then I have to look at all the other constraints except for C. And now I look at these other probabilities. And then there are all these other constraints, but they sit inside here. Um, and in a similar way, if I want to calculate what is the marginal if I'm only constrained through C, well, I look at my color. Then I have the constraint C, which sees the other colors involved in C. You sum out everything except my color. And now, but you have to see the rest of the world somehow, and the rest of the world enters through all these other guys here. OK? Now, if you were on a tree and you insert these inside each other, one step after another, OK, so let's say i would be the root of the tree, you get the margin of i. Now you multiply these out, you get all the constraints which are, so the root sort of, then you get all these other constraints here. Then you get these. Now you sum over the variables in the next layer of your tree. Now you get these guys. You insert it into itself, and you collect all the sums, and you collect all these terms. And when you are done at the leaves of your tree, you have collected all the factors of phi i you saw in the previous formula. You have co collected all these factors psi c. And you have summed over all the variables except the original one of the root. So you actually do get the marginal of the root. And so this is exact on trees. And it's easy to implement. So I mean, even if you have very complicated models, it's easy to program. It's really essentially as short as I've written it here. And it often works very well in practice. Yes. Um, and so the question is, when does the solution of this converge to the right answer? Okay. And um, we know a little bit about rigorously about that in certain simple models. So one of them is maximum weight matching. Um, I will go into that in more detail, so I will not define it for you now. It was known relatively early that it works on bipartite graphs, provided you have a unique maximum weight matching. And in general, it works for not only matchings, but so-called B matchings. So for those of you who know enough but not quite what B matching is, B matchings are you, f you fix the degree of the subgraph of every vertex to be B. Or more general, B could be a vector. So for every vertex you fix, I want a certain degree. And then you choose the subgraph of your big graph, which has the fixed degrees. But other than that, you sum over all possibilities. And 
So this works under one condition, which is that when the corresponding linear relaxation is tight, and I will tell you more about that, so I will for the moment not go into that. It works in other cases as well. Nash bargaining, I, um, I don't know how I'm running. And there are sort of some other cases where it works as well, so I will not go into these. Okay, so now we come to this matching example. So I will tell you the model, I will derive BP for you, and then I will give you the exact results. So in order to formulate the model, I have a graph, I have weights on the graph, and then I want to define a matching. So what is a matching? Well, you match people up, or in other words, I have sort of edges which represent the matching, and then what you need is that, obviously, to be a matching, I need that each vertex only sits in one edge, right? Because otherwise you don't call it a matching. Because if I sort of in an edge with Jennifer and with him, then I'm, I'm, I'm sort of overmatched. And if I'm in no edge, then I'm not matched. So for matching, everybody has to sit in exactly one edge. So if this is your graph, this would be a perfect matching. An unperfect matching is one where at mo I'm in at most one edge, but maybe some people are sort of unlucky and left out. And you can do that for non-perfect matchings as well. Okay, and the maximum weight matching is just a matching which has the largest weight. So there's a sum of the edges which are matched is maximal. Interesting in, I don't know, if you want to match, I don't know, students to universities and you believe in social welfare, then you want to say, okay, you sort of have the best sum of education or the best generated ROI if you're a politician and an economist or whatever. There are many reasons why we want to maximize something in matchings. And so what's a graphical model? Well, since we can put an edge in or not, that's a very natural variable. So the variable actually sits here on the edges of your graph. And it's zero if the edge is vacant and one if it's included. So one if the two endpoints are matched. And then your constraint is just that the sum of this xij's is equal to one for each i, which just means that every i sits in exactly one edge. And then the probability distribution, I'm not yet at the max weight matching, so if I have what we call a temperature beta, here is my constraint, which is up there. So if this constraint is not satisfied, this is zero and this will not appear. And then I give a weight which collects all the edges which are in the matching, and if they are not in the matching, this is zero and doesn't count. And if you send beta to infinity, you will get the maximum weight matching. Could the constraints also become uninergy, like the? Yes, so the constraints could become soft, um, which, so you could replace this by e to the minus some large number times this guy. Um, it turns out that we, I will eventually take the limit better to infinity anyhow, and I don't need that, but I could do that as well. It would make my derivation actually more complicated, not easier. So now how do we get the belief propagation equations? Before I do that, some notations, I leave out the constraints because I don't want to write this ugly sums all the time. The message, the edge sends a message to the constraint. So these were these marginals of the edge if I ignore the constraint at j. Um, there's a second message which actually is not important here because it turns out the factor graph has degree two and you can integrate out one of the two messages and get equations just for the other one. And finally, Belief propagation you should always think of, you send sort of beliefs over these edges in your factor graph, and the beliefs are in general probability distribution. So it's sort of conceptually a little bit complicated because you send around probability distributions. But luckily, discrete dis probability distributions just are a finite set of numbers. So you set around a set of numbers. And the number we set around here is the ratio of the probability, it's one and zero, so it's p over one minus p. Well, that's just the message I decide to send around. So now, how does this work? Okay, so let's look at a tree. Okay, so 
mu i to j is the probability the edge i j is not occupied if we forget the constraint at j. So if I forget the constraint of j and I'm on a tree, that's the same as if j would be the root of the tree. So we have this picture. Under there, the tree continues, but up there, we have cut off the rest. And now, if I want the edge to be vacant, since at i we have this constraint and have to be perfect, one of the other edges must be occupied. This is the sum there. And there is the probability that that edge occupied in the tree under it, which means that now we do as if i would be the root of the tree. And um, here is the probability that the other guys are vacant. And I can do the same for the probability of being occupied. And what do I have here in addition? Well, if it's occupied, I get the weight of that. And I have to normalize because these are not probability distributions. But if I take the ratio, this unknown constant dropped out, which is nice for me. So in other words, you calculate that. You divide sort of this by this. You get e to the minus this m. And here, you calculate it. And now everybody can take the limit beta goes to infinity, and you get a max. Okay? So I derived for you this equation. So we have derived the belief propagation algorithm for matching. Okay? So whenever you want to derive belief propagation, you do as if you were on a tree, and you define your messages on your variables. But then you use this method on the full graph. And that's how it's related to mean field, where again, sort of this, sort of like if you have high degree graphs that behave locally like trees, and sort of has to do with the fact that things locally behave like trees, then this might be useful. Okay? So you initialize in some way. You could initialize every message with zero. I decide to initialize them with these weights. And then you iterate according to the equation I have done. You run for a while. And when nothing changes, you say, I'm done. Um, well, that would be sort of a heuristic, right? So what can we? So it turns out, and what does it mean I'm done? Well, I still have to calculate for you what would be the matching. And that's very natural what we should do. For each variable, we look which edge going into the variable has the largest message. And I choose that one. Now, that could lead to a problem, because here are my two variables. This one says, you are the one which has the largest message, so I choose you. But this guy, being Jennifer and being contrarian, says, I don't want to choose you. I have a larger weight to him. So now there's a conflict, right? So in general, it could be that the union of these edges is not a legitimate matching. But it turns out, on trees, if you start at the leaves, there's no, nothing on the bottom anymore. You can't have a mistake there. And so if you iterate it as many times as the tree is deep, all these, these contradictions are gone, and this m of t is actually the correct matching. And so we know that on trees, but that is, that's all I derived for you. Okay? So this is what I proved for you. So the question is, are there other situations where this gives the correct answer, and how fast? And I think this will be the last exact mathematics I do here for you. So what is known? So you write down what's called the linear relaxation. So you, your xij's were these variables which were 0 or 1. And I make them, I allow them to become real. And now I can calculate Max's mass, my differentiation, and so on. I can do sort of analysis. And I have some constraints, which are the original. So the variables now lie between 0 and 1. And this is my original constraint. I have something called the dual. If you know what a Lagrange multiplier is, this is sort of the equations involved for the Lagrange multipliers. And now I can state the result for you, which is if this original equation there has an integer optimum, and so it has a unique optimum which happens to be integer, then belief propagation works. And it actually works after time t, which is, forget all the details, which is linear in the number of vertices. This epsilon has to do something with the fact how far away the next solution is. Good.
Um, so now I'm coming to a problem which is very relevant for applications, but for which we don't know that much mathematically. So it's a so-called Steiner tree problem. We again have it. So you may know the guy. Um, so you have a graph. You have a cost on edges again. Think of the graph as the internet. Think of the edges as costs you have to pay to transmit messages on the internet. And think of the terminals at the terminals at which people want to watch a movie. Okay? And we want to sort of do peer-to-peer. -peer. We want to put a movie on one of the computers, and then every other terminal should see the movie, and I want to pay as little money as possible. So what will I do for that? Well, I have to find a subnetwork of the internet which connects all these terminals. It should minimize the cost, so it better be a tree, because if it's not a tree, I could remove something and we get the same effect and paying less. And it should have minimal cost. So that is the Steiner tree problem. So why, what, why is it called Steiner tree? Well, it's actually called after a guy, and it comes from a geometric problem, which is, so assume here is the Simons Institute in California, and, well, no, it's hard. Turn it around. This is California. This is here. And maybe there's another one to be opened in Alaska, which David hasn't told us yet about. Okay? They're roughly an equilateral triangle. And they want to put fast internet connection between them. So if you just think naively, you might just put one here and one there and say that's the shortest connection. Turns out is we could convince Jim to put another Simons Institute in the middle of the country and put wires to that one. We have to put out less wire. And this is actually relevant. It comes from the monopoly times of telecoms, where telecoms were charged by the shortest networks you could build. And companies realized opening offices in the Midwest would make their bill cheaper. And Congress eventually put into a law that you should use the Steiner tree pricing for monopoly pricing on phone companies. And these guys know the guy who invented this. <laughs> Possibly, I have to think about it a little. Um, OK, so if you do this on a network, that's what you get here. Um, and so now we want to solve this problem. And it's actually a hard problem. It's actually NP complete, it turns out. So we will want to use belief propagation to approximately solve that. There's a little problem. I said belief propagation works very nicely if you have local constraints. But we have a global constraint, namely we should connect all the terminals. And if you look at the edges, that involves all the edges. And sure, I can write one constraint involving all the edges, but then my messages are super complicated and it doesn't really help. So what do we do? We actually come up with a new representation which allows us to make this local. So the new representation is as follows. So we designate one of the terminals as the root. Forget okay, that's a little technical detail I will not talk about. And we introduce two variables for each node. We introduce a distance and a parent. So what are these? Well, if you had a tree, then the distance would be the distance to the root. And the parent would be the person which sits up from you one nearer to the root. And then if you happen not to be in the tree, what would be your parents? Well, you don't have a parent. So this is the good person who is the parents of all the orphans. So this is the orphan parent. So we have this one star parents if you're not in the tree. And otherwise, you get the parent which is your parent in the tree. And if you're the root, you are your own parent. And that's why we have this little loop there. And if you think about it, now you could ask, Jennifer gives me some DIs and PIs, and I have to decide whether it actually came from a tree or not. How the heck am I going to do that? Well, it's not so, so difficult. It turns out that you just have a few constraints you have to check. So all the terminals should not be orphans, because they have a real parent. And if you are not an orphan, and your parent is not the root, then your parents should be one nearer to the root, and it should not be an orphan either. These are the constraints. 
You can put the costs into all the edges from you to your pounds. That counts all the costs. And then we can write the probability distribution just like that. Okay, so this is the constraint of the terminals. This is the weight of the edge going from me to my pound. And these are the other constraints. And if you write that out, you will see that only the di's, pi's appear, which lead to a tree, and all of them appear, and they all appear with the right weight. So this is an identity. But now, the yes. Okay, so these ones are one if the if the logical assertion in the parenthesis is true, and otherwise they're zero. And there are variants of it which I don't want to go into here either. Okay. So we don't know much rigorous about it. It works if, if we're actually looking at the spanning tree. All terminals appear. So all vertices are terminals. So you have to cover everyone. Then actually, if it converges, it converges to the correct solution. But non-rigorous, we actually works, it works very well. It beats all the benchmarks. So if there are, unless you have very small benchmarks where sort of everybody can do it exactly, the usual benchmarks are based on some LP relaxation. And it turns out that when you have large enough instances, apparently the LP relaxation algorithms are so slow that you can't run them long enough. And ours run fast enough that A, we are faster, and B, we get better optima. And these instances are so large that nobody knows what the real optimum is because the best optimum is what the best algorithm gives us. And in many cases, that was ours. And on biological data, the same happens when you want to do sort of data sets which involve humans. All previous algorithms were so slow that people gave up, and this one works. Which gets me to applications in biology. So I don't know whether I, I think I should allow questions again. So questions up to here. How big of graph can one practically run this on? I mean, how Let me answer it when I get to the biology, because these are some of the largest we have done it on. I should point out that the microphones now do work. So if you ask a question, ah. push the speaker button. It works. I was suggesting to modify the movie, but I guess this was easy. <laughs> Good. So I will tell you about kind of biological problems we are looking at. I will introduce a version of the Steiner tree problem, which is called price collecting Steiner trees. And then I will look at applications of that. And then I give you a few variants. So what's the problem? So the standard dogma is that we have DNA, and then it gets transcribed into RNA, which then produces protein. And nowadays, we know that these proteins interact with each other. And then some other proteins, and therefore then some proteins will dock to the gene and then either uh, suppress or enhance production of other RNA so you get some feedback network. So we get what's called a gene regulatory network, which looks like that. Right Somewhere here are your genes, and then things happen, and they get deposited here again. And you get, and these interactions are called the protein interactome, which is a fancy name for the graph between the proteins. So it's a directed graph. It's, it's in general a directed graph. And actually, in many cases, we treat it as an undirected graph, even though when you do this Steiner tree representation with the tree and the root, I could sort of do directions easily away from the root. right? But in many cases, actually, while it's directed, I mean, these are, so people draw this graph, but nobody knows whether these two really don't interact or do interact. So we can at best put a probability. And actually, whether this actually was causing this or this is causing that is even less clear. So it might actually be better to ignore the direction, just say, I don't know. Because these, I mean, these are really super messy data. I mean, the pictures look pretty, but the world is not. <laughs> um, so why are we interested in that? Well, it turns out that many that problems with this gen regulatory network 
are the sources of many diseases, some of the nastiest, some of those of your brain, and in particular, a lot of cancer has to do with certain parts in the gene regulatory network not working correctly, and then your cell suddenly divides much more than it should. Um, so what we like to do, we would like to infer the network structure from these messy partial data we have, and I will tell you a little bit more what data we have. And then we would identify, we would like to identify particular nodes in this network and say, maybe these are responsible for the dysregulation. And if we could know that, maybe we could sort of use these or the combination of those for drug target, right? If I know that sort of if you, if the cell divides too much, it uses this particular protein to make this all work, then I would knock out that protein and hopefully kill the cancer. I mean, naively speaking. Good. So this fits into this general big data drug paradigm that all these startups are doing around Boston. I'm sure there are millions around New York also, where you have all this sort of data you get from your bio labs. Then you hire mathematicians. You pay them a lot of money. They come up with computational models. And they say, choose these few points and try a drug there. And then the drug companies do that. And if it works once in 100 times, the mathematician gets even more money. <laughs> so, so this is the general paradigm. And in the simplest case, what we have is two kinds of data, gene expression data. So these are called microRNAs. So you have these little chips. And on that, you have all these dots, which each of them measures whether a particular gene or the protein corresponding to a particular gene is how, how, how strong it's expressed. So in the simplest case, this is a black and white picture. And I mean, it's yellow because it's fluorescent, but think of it as black and white. And if it's very white, that means the gene is highly expressed. And if it's sort of black, it's not expressed at all, and you get sort of the level. And you can then compare to background data and say, OK, this gene is just expressed like in a normal cell, but this gene is much higher expressed in a cancer cell, and this gene is much lower expressed in the cancer cell, and that's called differential expression. And the second set you have, which is this really messy database, uh, the interactum of the probability of interactions between different proteins. And yes, sometimes it's directed, but we say it's so dirty that I ignore the direction. So how would we want to infer a network? So what we would like to do is we would say, given this data, what is the most likely network which explains the data? And to explain that, I will have one more Steiner tree for you, the so-called price-collecting Steiner tree. So again, I have a graph, again, I have costs, again, I have terminals. But now I have prices on the terminals. And you don't have to connect to all terminals. Just when you get to a terminal, and then you're allowed to collect the price. Okay? So if David really wants to see his mathematics, Maybe he's willing to pay me a lot of money when I serve him. So I better serve him, whereas maybe some other people here are not that interested in mathematics. Yes, they say they want to see this movie about mathematics. But actually, they are, they're never going to pay me much or not at all. So I give them a very low price. And I much more care about connecting him. And in this biological setting, there will be certain nodes. I'm sure they will take part in a pathway, so I put a high price. And others I don't really know, so I put lower prices. So, so now we minimize again the cost here. And then we collect as much price as we can. And the parameter lambda, which you just tweak as you do your, do your calculation, is sort of determining how much the prices count and how much the cost counts. And as lambda turns to infinity, obviously, I get the standard standard tree problem, because then I have to collect every price, which is non-zero. So what does that mean in biology? So I have, again, this cost function. So we will choose for the cost of an edge minus the probability, where the log of the probability, that this edge actually exists. Okay, So I have this messy data, and we know that over all circumstances, these two, these two proteins have a certain probability of interacting. If the probability is 1, 
I don't pay anything for it. If it's very low, I pay a lot to put in this edge because I sort of violate Occam's razor by a lot by saying this edge is in, even though I was told by my experimental colleagues it's very unlikely. And in a similar way, what do I do with the prices here? I look what's called the p-value. So the p-value is one if with probability one, what I observe right now is explained by my background data. So which means it's not differentially expressed. It's exactly expressed as I, as I would expect it. And p gets smaller and smaller if it's either highly overexpressed or highly underexpressed because that's unlikely. And so I collect sort of the prices for these guys because if it's highly overexpressed or highly underexpressed, that means this protein is very particular to this pathway and I should include it. So what are the Steiner nodes? So in general, Steiner nodes are these things you added in even though they were not terminals. And for the price collecting Steiner tree, these are nodes which have zero or low prices. So here is a network. The large dots means high prices. The small dots mean low prices. So you will want to collect this price, this price, this price, and this price. So you get a network like that. You have to include those because otherwise it's not connected. Then you can't pick up these juicy prices. And, but this node you had to add in, so it's a Steiner node. So in the context of biology, the Steiner nodes are nodes which are likely to participate, but you didn't see it when you just looked at the expression data. And so they lead to proteins which were not previously known to participate in your pathway. So they, these, these are these drug targets I was talking about. You may want to try them out. And so we tried that first on yeast because even though the data are messy, they're not that messy and they're not that big. So you see this is sort of the graphs have 10,000 nodes or so and they have a little more edges and on this it works very well. So given the set of weights, um, we, we sort of had, so we had the weights from the interactome. We took 20, 56 large-scale gene expression data sets. And for each data set, we get the prices according to differential expression. And then we construct the corresponding 56 trees. We actually did a bounded depth because it's not very likely to have the pathway, which is sort of really skinny and long. That sort of doesn't make much sense. And um, then we merge the solutions to get one network because the actual pathway is probably not a tree. So just because you happen to have this minimal tree, maybe there's another one nearby and you, get, you put them all together. And Here's what you get. That's how the network looks. Well, it's a part of the network. I didn't show the whole network. And two types of proteins, those which were terminals, and those are often known uh, participants in that pathway. And then proteins which were not differentially expressed, but bridge between different subnetworks to make the thing connected. This is one. And so we said, OK, is it really important or not, right? So we got some experimentalists. It took us much longer to find the experimentalists than to do the mass, because they all said, you're mathematicians. Why should we do an experiment based on your mass? And, but eventually, we found some people in southern France. And they did an experiment. They knocked out this gene. And lo and behold, actually, no pheromone pathway anymore. And so that is experimental proof that this thing was actually important. It did exactly what we expected. The pathway fell apart because you couldn't go from A to B anymore. So now I have to see how much I want to do this. Um, so if you now go from yeast to mammals, it turns out that you have much more inco incomplete data. You have 10 times more transcription factors. You have huge intergenic regions. Everything gets much larger. And we had friends, well, they were actually, in the beginning, we didn't know their friends because they were doing something very similar. And they thought we stole their results. And we stole, thought they stole our result. 
turned out we really independent worked on that. They worked with some computer scientists from MIT who gave them tips and said, oh, Steiner trees, very simple, use LP algorithms here, uh, use, yes, use linear program relaxation of the shelf, databases. He gave them the best known algorithm, worked very well on yeast, and they produced exactly the same result as we on yeast, and we were really first both upset. But then we realized it's really independent. And furthermore, they tried the same on this human data set, and the standard algorithms were just too slow, even though they used sort of their 50 PCs they had in parallel, they just couldn't really get through the data. And so here is what they found using our algorithm. So they looked at what is called glioblastoma. So it's a really terrible disease. It's a brain cancer if you get uh, so Ted Kennedy died of it. We have a friend who died of it. Most people, when they learn about it, they have a year to live. Maybe you have two years if you're lucky. Here is the survival. Hmm? Nine, months. Nine months. Yeah, I sort of, it depends. If you do nothing, you have sort of three months, okay? And, and you see, so this is the presentation. You, you do surgery, you lose your eyesight on one eye, and nevertheless, the thing comes. It's, it's terrible, terrible disease and much more in men than in women. And so we asked ourselves, uh, can we find that pathway using this price collecting Steiner trees? So, well actually, so this is what Ernest and his collaborators found, okay? So this is the network they found, and so there's a few, I will not go into everything. This is the penalty, so the price, if it's red, then it sort of was highly differential expressed. So the red nodes just must be there because you essentially start with them. Um, and now if you look at what are your little subnetworks, okay, some of them sort of people knew because they contain these juicy prices. Others, this one for example has no juicy price but makes a lot of sense. I mean if you have DNA damage repair, sure you have problems with cancer. Um, but then there were others like this ESR there, which was unknown, no high price. And so they started to look at that, said, okay, let's order the nodes by importance. Importance is some method I will not talk about. And well, the first one, SRC, is a well-known ingredient in many times of cancers and had anyhow a non-zero price, was relatively large. I mean, it was not one of the large prices, but it was relatively large. And then there was this ESR1, which had no price. Nobody had any idea what it has to do with glioblastoma. And so it turns out that it's actually an estrogen receptor. So this is the first link between gender and glioblastoma, because obviously so. Um, then we did some experimental tests, sort of where you throw this estradiol into a tube, and lo and behold, actually the cells don't grow that much anymore, okay? So it's a possible drug therapy for glioblastoma. Now, I mean, God forbid, but if I had glioblastoma, first of all, you had to get this estrogen into my head. It's not quite clear how you do that because of the blood barrier to the brain. And we also don't know what this estrogen would do to my brain. So I'm not saying we have done a cure, okay? But it's at least some possible uh, therapy for glioblastoma. I will skip over that because I only have a few minutes left. So let me just say what I'm, you think I shouldn't skip? How, how much more time do I have? Probably oh, I don't have to skip, okay. So <laughs> assume that instead of, assume that I have a situation where I have many disjoint pathways appearing at the same time. That would be something very hard to discover with this kind of algorithms because I insist there is a tree, and so this will link these different, either I will only get one of the little pathways, or I will link them artificially together. So we would like, instead of to do what's called a Steiner tree, a Steiner forest. So what's a Steiner forest? Well, instead of a tree, you now take K disjoint trees, and you again want to minimize these costs, okay? And now, how are we going to do that? Because I don't know what are the K trees. If I knew what are the K trees, then I could call all of them a root and do it separately. 
But now I have to try out all these k trees and then exactly I get again back to the combinatorial problem we have all the time been avoiding. So what do we do instead? What we do is we add an artificial node A, okay? And we put some coupling to this artificial node. So rather than explaining it here, let me explain it on the picture. So this is your network. Okay, these are the, 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 the terminals where you put high prices. And this is the artificial node which is connected to everybody. And you can tune how strongly it's connected. Okay, and now you say, run your algorithm, find a Steiner tree for Z. This will look something like that. Okay, so you have your artificial node, and it happens to be connected just to three nodes in your original network, and then the rest is your tree. And now you forget the artificial node, and then I have one, two, three. So I have a forest with three trees. And if I make these edges expensive, I get very few of them. And if I make them cheap, I get a lot of them. If I make them really cheap, I just get this artificial node connected to every single node. And my forest consists of a lot of single nodes not connected to each other, not that interesting. Um, so you have to tune this parameter. Um, and so it reveals parallel working pathways in addition to these hidden trees. And when you do it, so this was more a methodological paper. When you do it in biology, in yeast, you get all these little pathways. And my biology colleagues tell me that they're very reasonable. And the same is true for glioblastoma. You find sort of separate pathways. And we, so this is the one place where I have not claimed any new biological results, it's sort of more a methods paper, but it seems to work very well in finding known sub-pathways. So the last thing I want to talk about is patient-specific networks. So imagine I have a group of patients, 100, 1,000 over the US, which have breast cancer. And now for each of them, I do my little Steiner tree, and I get a patient-specific network where they all have breast cancer. So probably I should use the fact that I can learn, learn something for, so my breast cancer might profit from the fact, well, learning about the network might profit from learning about the network of other people. And that's what we want to do, okay? So what we do is we look at shared features and then we update again for individual patients. So what do I mean by that? So what do we do? We start with, these networks of the different patients. So the, the background network is the same because that's just the a priori probability of being connected in this uh, interactome. The prices are different because if you do the experiment on different patients, they have different genes which are differentially expressed. So I get different forests. Here they are. Now I look. Some of the forests are so different that even though they may overlap in a node, it's not very significant. So I only look at forests which are similar. But if forests are similar, I look, do they overlap? And so if, if I and Jennifer have similar forests and we have five nodes which overlap, then maybe these five nodes should get a higher price in general because that means that even though they were originally not differentially expressed, in many patients, cancer patients, they show up, so you put higher prices there. And now you iterate. Now you do again, now you have new prices, you do the same thing, and you go on. Okay, and that leads to sort of highly patient-specific networks which have input from the network of other patients. So that would be one paradigm how you could do highly personalized medicine while making use of the data of sort of a lot more patients. Okay, so, and it turns out that this an example, again, at least in the lab, it looked very nice. So what we found is that some of these common Steiner nodes were actually treatable with a drug which is known to work very well in gastrointestinal tumors. So again, I mean, we are not a drug company. We are sort of scientists who 
get access to data and work with some doctors, so we, we didn't put it past the test tube, but in the test tube it looked very nice. So that's it. Okay, so I told you what graphical models are, and that they allow you a nice representation of uh, random variables which have only local dependencies, or in some cases, like these trees, after changing the representation, um, you can take into account some global dependencies. Belief approximation gives us a way to approximate marginals and modes, and rigorously we know that it works in particular cases. Um, in very simple particular cases, it turns out, in practice, it converges very rapidly and works very well on benchmarks. And the biological evidence is that it works well in sort of identifying regulatory pathways. Thank you.